One of the most interesting things, and I think definitely that we can say about New Jersey as a state is that um, it has a diverse uh, population um, and stories of people, uh, various migrants, um, immigration. Um, my folks have migrated out, um, folks have come back. And one of the essential um, conversations that has really gone on over hundreds of years is the relationship of those who migrate or those who immigrate here um, to um, what they may consider to be their homeland, um, this concept of the diaspora. Um, obviously, it's not unique to New Jersey um, and identity here, but um, we have this opportunity today to look at um, different communities over approximately 150 years um, and to really examine the ways in which people have made a home here while forging a connection um, to what they consider to be their homeland, the place that's close to their heart, to their identity and to their culture, even as they identify um, as a part of the American um, community. So today, the title of today's um, discussion will be A Nation Without Borders, Immigrant Ties to the Homeland. So I would like to start the discussion with an introduction um, to our first speaker. Please join me in welcoming Harvey Strom. Harvey Strom teaches courses in American history, US government, film history, and Holocaust. Sage Colleges awarded him the Susan Warren Beatty Faculty Award for Excellence in Research for 2019 to 2020, the Harder McClellan Fellow from 2015 to 2017. His research interests are War of 1812, American Jewish History, American and Canadian Aid to Ireland in 1847, 1863, and 1880, anti-Catholic nativism in the 19th century and World War II. He is the former section chair for Democratic Theory, program chair, vice president, and president of the Northeastern Political Science Association, and remains the section chair for international relations and American foreign policy for the New York State Political Science Association. Harvey helped curate exhibitions on the Jewish farmers of, uh, and excuse me if I do not say this correctly, the Rensselaer County in 1998, the Jews of Troy in 2000, Jews of Albany in 2003, and Jews of Schenectady in 2006. He has delivered professional research papers and given talks on local Jewish history, War of 1812, anti-Catholic nativism in New Jersey, World War I and II, and American and Canadian aid to Ireland. Andrew Strom, his son, graduated from State Sage in 2009. Uh, please welcome Harvey um, to, um, so we, we're looking forward to hearing his paper on New Jersey's aid to Ireland during the Little Famine of 1879 and 1880. Welcome, Harvey. Thank you for inviting me to speak at the conference. In what became known as the Little Famine of 1879 to 82, food shortages and desperation reappeared in Ireland. Rain and bad weather conditions in the summer of 1879 created the potato blight of the great hunger and produced disastrous crops in Western Ireland. Crop yields fell to half of those of the 1870s. A perfect storm of deprivation reappeared in Western Ireland and the concern about uh, that there would be mass starvation. 200 Catholic priests warned in June of 1879 of the danger and their parishioners in Southern and Western Ireland faced the risk of starvation. By January of 1880, 
grim reports came from Catholic clergy. From this grim prospects, many fled to the United States. Irish immigration went up a third from 437,000 in the 1870s to eight, uh, excuse me, to 655,000 in the 1880s. As the little famine pushed the Irish across the Atlantic, New Jersey's Irish immigration grew from 62,000 born in Ireland in 1860 to 95,000 in 1900. The influx of Irish to Jersey City in particular allowed the Irish to take control, becoming for some the New Ireland in the Garden State, an honor shared with Newark because in 1880, 40,000 men and women of Irish ancestry lived in or near Newark. Responding to the crisis, the Duchess of Marlborough created a, a relief committee in Dublin in December 1879. In January of 1880, the Mansion House Committee, chaired by Edmund Gray, the Lord Mayor of Dublin, reestablished itself uh, with the goal of attracting donations from the United States, Australia, and Canada. This non-denominational non secular committee attracted a lot of contributions from Americans, including from the Irish Relief Committees in Newark, Jersey City, and Trenton. Irish nationalist leader, Charles Stuart Parnell, advocate of land reform and the Land League established his own relief committee and became popular in Irish American communities, including New Jersey. Parnell arrived in New York City in January of 1880, spending two months speaking in 62 cities in the United States, including in both Jersey City and Newark and he set up American offices in Manhattan. Parnell's barnstorming trip to the United States fostered the branches of the Land League and every Irish community, every community in New Jersey, where there was a sufficient number of Irish, uh, supported a branch in the early 1880s, as well as a number supported uh, ladies' Land League chapters that were established by his mother and two of his sisters who happened to be living in Bordentown, New Jersey. Parnell had family connections in New Jersey. Delia Parnell, his mother, an Irish American, and her father, Admiral Charles Stewart of the United States Navy, and grandfather, Charles Stewart Parnell, had an estate in Bordentown. In 1874, Delia returned to the United States from Europe, and in 1880, census, uh, she's listed as a resident of Bordentown. Parnell's sisters, Fanny, Theodosia, accompanied their mother to New Jersey. Fanny already earned a reputation as an author of Irish nationalist poetry. Fanny's younger sister, Anna, moved to New Jersey to assist in the famine relief efforts in 1879, partially because of the influence of the Parnell women. Bordentown forwarded to the Dublin nation donations for Irish relief in October of 1879, becoming the first community in the United States to collect funds to help with the food shortages in Ireland. So New Jersey was first. Later in October, 1880, the sisters established the Ladies' Land League in New York City to raise money for the Land League and for famine relief. Delia assumed the presidency and Anna and Fanny took on most of the organizational work. While her activist daughters received much of the public attention, Delia was a major advocate for Irish home rule in the United States, and she was dubbed the Lady Chieftainess. Fanny actively campaigned for the, for the Land League and Famine Relief. Some of the chapters organized by the Parnell women included, by September 1881, two Land League chapters in Jersey City and chapters in Morristown, Millstone, Montclair, and Patterson. Single Irish women in particular joined the Ladies' Land League, especially working class women. Meetings provided an opportunity for Irish women of New Jersey to socially interact outside the narrow confines uh, of their homes and of their work. Unfortunately, Fanny died of a heart attack at the age of 33 at the Stewart family estate in Bordentown 
on July 20th, 1882. Members of the Land League and Ladies Land League chapters formed an honor guard to accompany her remains from Trenton to Philadelphia. Two years later, Delia Parnell sold the Stewart Mansion and surrounding property uh, to her son, Charles Stewart Parnell of Wicklow, Ireland for $20,000. A public meeting in Washington in January of 1880, including senators, congressmen, and justices of the Supreme Court call for public support for famine relief. The meeting publicized the causes of famine relief, several groups organized. In the residents of Philadelphia organized a relief committee it took on a national importance led by John Wanamaker. And residents in Western New Jersey uh, actually contributed to that relief committee. In New York City, several Jewish organizations, maybe several Irish organizations in December of 1879 persuaded Judge Charles Daly, who led the 1862-63 campaign in New York to lead a national campaign for Irish relief. The New York City Irish Relief Committee included a number of prominent New Yorkers, including William Grace, who soon became the first Irish Catholic mayor of New York City. Seeking to publicize the crisis in Ireland, the committee sent out 40,000 copies of an appeal to the American public. The New York Committee asked Americans of every nationality and creed to aid the starving Irish. Some of the residents of New Jersey also contributed to the New York Irish Relief Committee. However, uh, then to add further confusion, James Gordon Bennett Jr., editor of the New York Herald, created his own relief committee in February of 1880. Successfully stealing the limelight, uh, the Herald Relief Fund became the most successful of the various Irish relief committees in the United States, especially after uh, Bennett contributed $100,000. Uh, the residents of New Jersey contributed. In addition, in 1863, American bishops set, created their own separate relief committee and sent the money to either the Catholic bishop in Dublin or to bishops in different parts of Ireland, like our Pope. Following in the footsteps of Bishop Bailey's famine relief efforts in 1863, Bishop Michael Corrigan sympathized with the plight of the poor suffering people in Ireland. In his pastoral letter, to the clergy of the Newark Diocese, he noted that several of our clergy have already made inquiries concerning the propriety of sending aid to our distressed brethren in Ireland. After citing an account of the Bishop of Kalala about the distress in his diocese, Bishop Corian suggested each priest make a collection on St. Patrick's Day. Uh, and the Newark Diocese would send the collections to the various bishops in Ireland. Some priests anticipated the need of Corrigan's pastoral. In Patterson, for example, parishioners at St. John's attended a concert for Irish relief in mid-January, raising $1,100. Reverend William McNulty, born in Ballyshannon, Ireland, served as pastor for St. John's from 1863 to 1922, a record in New Jersey's Catholic history. McNulty sent the, the donation of $1,100 to Bishop Michael Logan Rappau for the distribution among the distressed people in, the, in your neighboring diocese. Orange had an overwhelmingly Irish population in the 1880s. All the parishioners in St. John's in the 1880s were of Irish birth or descent. H.P. Fleming, the rector at St. John's Parish, sent, Barish, assume, sent Bishop Logue the funds collected by my parishioners for suffering Ireland. Fleming also sent donations raised in orange to Archbishop Edward McCabe in Dublin. Trenton's Irish lived in Irish town in the fourth ward. Trenton's Little Ireland. Thaddeus Hogan, pastor of St. John's Church collected funds in early February and sent them to Bishop Lowe, hoping that the sufferings of the people would be rewarded in heaven because it is sad to witness the distress of the brave and religious Irish people. Members of St. Patrick's Temperance Society in Camden made a collection for Ireland and gave $200 to uh, Father Fitzsimmons, rector of the Church of the Immaculate Conception, who forward to Bishop Lowe. 
uh, Father Smith and Simmons followed up with a second donation from our people for the Irish sufferers. Churches in Ireland also received donations from an unlikely source, Mrs. Parnell's Relief Fund. In New Jersey, Fanny and Anna Parnell quietly solicited donations for Irish relief in early 1880 and sent it to the Archbishop John McHale and to Margaret Anna Cusack, the nun of Canmare, uh, a member of the Sisters of Poor Clares who set up, his, set up her own relief fund distributing $75,000 to help the poor suffering from the famine. She also had a New Jersey connection, establishing a convent of the Sisters of St. Joseph of Peace in Englewood, New Jersey in the 1880s. The cities of Newark, Jersey City and Trenton decided to follow a less sectarian path and joined in negotiations uh, for a, uh, as he joined in a nonpartisan and ecumenical effort to solicit subscriptions for the Mansion House Relief Committee. Example, in mid-January, Mayor Rice and Trenton, on the suggestion of Charles Stewart Parnell, appointed an Irish Famine Relief Committee. Rice appointed ward committees for Trenton plus neighboring communities. The mayor assumed the role as treasurer for the relief fund and a meeting was held on 21st of January, 1880. The local press reinforced the need to help because there is a widespread distress and appalling severity in Ireland. Newspapers reminded their readers that Americans throughout the nation were donating promptly and generously. And it is hoped that Trenton will not be behind her sister cities in making liberal response to this appeal. The people of Trenton should give because of their abundance to the starving Irish. Americans repeated the theme of 1847, that Americans were a people of plenty. They had a moral obligation to help the starving people of Ireland. And the people of Trenton uh, followed suit and uh, essentially contributed. Um, many prominent citizens of Jersey City also called for Irish relief in December. Citizens of all nationalities, attended the movement, uh, not just confined to any nationality or creed, but this is the spontaneous outburst of the liberal and charitable instincts of the people of New Jersey City. Political leaders took part, including former Governor Joseph Bettle, a Democrat, Attorney General A. Hardenberg, Judge John Jarek, uh, ex-Mayor Charles O'Neill, the first Catholic mayor of Jersey City, and a second generation Irish American. Uh, just prior to the meeting, the Argus made the point that many ladies are expected to be present and take an active part in the movement. Speakers told the audience of the magnitude of the crisis in Ireland and the need of residents of Hudson County to help. Resolutions adopted stressed uh, the need and the bond between the American and Irish people and the sympathy of the citizens of Hudson County. By the end of January, Mayor Hopper sent $1,755 to Mayor Gray in Dublin for the citizens of this city for the relief of the benefit of the famishing and suffering of Ireland. Events in Jersey City stressed the nonpartisan and ecumenical aspect of famine relief. Public support came from the people of different ethnicities and religious denominations. And this again became, and also apparently in Jersey City, there was a significant contribution of women. Meanwhile, Charles Stewart Parnell and the Irish Land League associate John Dillon arrived in New York on 1st of January, 1880. He traveled to 62 cities campaigning for Irish relief. He spoke before Congress and met with uh, President Rutherford B. Hayes, a rare honor for a foreign political leader. Although he did not visit Bordentown, Parnell spoke in Newark and Jersey City. On the 6th of January, Parnell arrived in Newark to speak at the Grand Opera House. Delegates of all the Irish societies in Newark and Orange met beforehand to prepare for Parnell's visit because of the popularity of Parnell and the Land League movement. Parnell's reception in Newark was an imposing demonstration, according to one of the newspapers, as the large crowds of Irish Americans gathered in the streets near the train station despite the fact they waited in the rain uh, to welcome the visitor from Ireland. 
members of Irish militia, militia companies appeared, um, politicians, newspaper editors, the Catholic clergy, and Irish Americans. Residents paid 25 cents to see Parnell, and the opera house was filled with an audience consisting of not just men, but many ladies uh, waiting to see and hear the rock star of Irish nationalism. Introductory remarks expressed the gratitude of the Irish American community for Parnell's visit and the support of all Americans for Irish relief and the cause of land reform, which is what Parnell spoke about. And he called for aid essentially distributed without distinction of creed or color. After his speech in Newark, Parnell went to Jersey City and once again, uh, Irish Americans in New Jersey identified with Parnell, the causes he advocated and the plight of the Irish people. Three times in the 19th century, Americans established voluntary relief committees to aid the starving in Ireland and the residents of New Jersey took part in each of these efforts to aid the starving. Historian Christine Kennelly noted in 1880, Americans aid was prompt and generous. Contemporary observers agreed the Mansion House Relief Committee's directors and board concluded all ranks and classes of Irish people were inspired by the unexampled generosity of America. The people of New Jersey in 1846-47, 1862-63, and 1879-80 gave us part of uh, a people-to-people -people movement from the United States to Ireland. This was not foreign aid from Congress, but the pennies, nickels, dimes, and dollars donated by the people of New Jersey of all religious denominations, nationalities, and political persuasions to help the starving people of Ireland. America emerged as the leader in voluntary international philanthropy in the 19th century, and the people of New Jersey played an important role in aiding the people in Ireland. And uh, again, from the Jersey ship for Ireland, which was sent in 1847 from Newark to the Parnell Irish Relief Fund in 1880. As a testimony to the lure of Parnell in the Garden State, the New Jersey Assembly passed a resolution in 1886 expressing New Jersey support for Charles Parnell and the Land League movement in Ireland. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Strong. Of course, as a as a feminist and someone who's um, studied women's organizing, um, it was very engaging for me to hear you highlight the different ways that women continue to um, support the movement and uh, negotiate it. So, and thank you for making that of note in your paper. I'm sure people will have questions. Um, again, we encourage people to put any questions in the Q&A box and we will address them towards the end of the program. Okay. Now I would like to introduce our next panelist. Our next panelist um, is Jonah Freed. Uh, Jonah is a fourth year's honors history student at McGill University in Montreal, Quebec. He is researching the Alliance Agricultural Colony, a 19th century Jewish utopian experiment in Vinland, New Jersey. His great, great, great grandparents, Jacob and Golda Greenblatt, were among the first to settle at the site. Jonah's investigations have taken him from Cumberland County to the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research in New York City. I hope I said that correctly. From archive collections in English, French, Yiddish, and Hebrew. He argues that New Jersey's Jewish agricultural projects were a practical and ideological response to 19th century anti-Semitism. Um, please join me in welcoming um, Jonah Reed. Thank you. 
Hello, everyone. Thank you for that introduction. <laughs> it's Yibo Institute in uh, Yiddish. So uh, yeah, I'll jump right into it. Thank um, you. <laughs> I, yeah. So uh, first, I'll give some background on uh, Jewish immigration to North America um, and why New Jersey in particular. Uh, then I'm going to discuss some of the Jewish aid organizations that helped to control this influx of uh, Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe. Uh, I'm going to examine the motivations behind some of the philanthropists who supported these projects, including the Mansion House Committee, actually, which uh, Professor uh, Straw mentioned. <laughs> uh, and uh, I will then uh, ask why New Jersey became this American Zion, this uh, location where so many Jewish agriculturalists consolidated and really formed a uh, almost society within a society. Uh, and I'll end with uh, some more uh philosophical questions about what this means for uh jewish america were these jewish americans or were they american jews or something else entirely uh so why focus on the 1880s when having this conversation when i pitched this project to my professor here at mcgill he said that i should really start in the 1870s but the 1880s are distinct because in this 10-year period Jewish immigrants uh, came to the United States and uh, Canada as well for largely ideological reasons, not just economic reasons, and arguably not even for economic reasons. There may have been economic reasons to stay in Russia during this time period. Uh, important groups in uh, Ukraine at this time, the Pale of Settlement, were the Amolam, among others, but the Amolam is especially important for the Jewish agriculturalist movement because uh, Amalam, which means the eternal people, uh, argue that to redeem themselves in a spiritual and also political sense, Jews needed to return to the land, to begin cultivating as their ancestors had, and so forth. Um, and they were active from uh, 1880 until 1887 before largely dying out for reasons that we'll explain shortly. Um, so that's why I focus on the 1880s. It's also uh, the 1880s when we see the infamous May Laws, a series of restrictive bills in uh, the Russian Duma, uh, which is their sort of parliament, um, well, was, <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, also essentially uh, enacted by fiat, by the Tsar, uh, that largely prohibited Jews from engaging in certain practices, especially establishing uh, new agricultural colonies. This was a large movement in the earlier part of the 1880s in southern Ukraine. Um, and that basically meant that Jews who believed in this ideology had to emigrate to have their ideology come to play. Uh, 1900, which is sort of the end of this period, is also when the Alliance colony in New Jersey, which is where my family is from and one of the most important Jewish agricultural colonies, uh, that's the year that they were transferred to the Baron de Hirsch Fund, which is another organization that I will speak about very shortly. But I see that as kind of the end in this ideological phase. Uh, largely because they emphasized more industrial trades, more training people to be American, not this sort of utopian experiment. So with that context, um, where were they coming from? Where were these Jews who were settling in New Jersey uh, coming from? They came from the Pale Settlement, which uh, was not just Ukraine. It was really all of uh, Congress Poland, where Jews had historically been able to settle. Uh, that's sort of a, a, an overgeneralization, but it it, it helps. Uh, and most of the people who made up the Amolam were from the very south, so Bessarabia, Kherson, uh, close to the Black Sea. That was the breadbasket of uh, 19th century Ukraine. Uh, these Jewish uh, agriculturalists uh, created a lot of produce for the Russian army, um, among other things. But uh, they were trained in agriculture. And that's important because most of the later Jewish immigrants, people who emigrated in the 1910s, 20s, 30s, uh, after the Holocaust as well, most of them were uh, from more northern pale, from places uh, like Warsaw or uh, if, if further from Lithuania, Vilna. Uh, they were more manufacturers, more uh, craftspeople. They lived in cities. They were not necessarily agriculturalists. Ukraine at this time was really a wild west uh, where people were engaging in farming, uh, herding, that kind of thing. And that's important context. Uh, it's also important when we're having this conversation to avoid anachronisms that are often attributed to this period. Uh, this is before the Bund, which was a radical socialist movement that uh, became very popular among um, Jewish people in this area 
far later in the uh, 1920s and 30s. Um, so this is before that. Uh, they were very opposed to emigration in particular, which is why they're worth mentioning. Uh, and then this was also before Zionism, which uh, Jewish nationalism, which of course was focused on returning Jews to the land of Israel, although the Amalam did settle in Israel, um, and that's an important conversation as well. Zionism as a widespread political ideology didn't become a force until the 1890s. So 1880s were still in a period of possibilities before that. Uh, so who were these major Jewish aid groups that made the Amalam's uh, idealism possible in New Jersey? Uh, the Alliance Un uh, Israelite Universelle, which is a French organization established in Paris in 1860, they operated all over the world, especially in the Middle East, but they did help Jewish immigrants uh, come to the United States, and Alliance was, of course, named for them because they provided most of the European um, passports and uh, uh, shipping line tickets and finances to help Jews get to New Jersey. The Hebrew Emigrant Aid Society coordinated with the Alliance Israeli Unifil. It was arguably a partner organization, and they were based in New York City, and they received the immigrants, and they really pushed for them to be settled as farmers in New Jersey. Uh, the Barrington Hirsch Fund, as I mentioned earlier, was a later organization established in 1891, and I would argue that they were different because it was not a disaster relief program. It wasn't established in response to a particular uh, problem. It was more focused on domesticating and uh, uh, training Jews who were already on these uh, farming colonies to either be farmers, to have trade in farming, or to uh, do other things and ultimately live in cities uh, to Americanize them. So that's an important uh change in priorities, I would argue. And maybe we should see them as NGOs. Uh, this is, a, you know, I risk anachronisms when I call groups like the Alliance Israeli Dude Versailles an NGO, um, at least in this period. Today, it is still around and it is an NGO. But they did lobby governments. They relied on private donations for most of what they did. They invoked human rights rhetoric. And they were diplomatic agents in their own right. Uh, they were involved in all kinds of causes, from uh, Irish relief, actually, as uh, Professor Strom <laughs> mentioned, um, to Jewish relief, of course, because they were Jewish organizations, fundamentally. Um, and uh, that's important in a period before the United Nations, before the League of Nations. Uh, they were really the forebears of uh, international diplomacy, in terms of human rights, anyway, uh, during this time. Uh, and this is just the protocol of a international convention on Jewish uh, emigrants uh, that was held in the uh, 1880s. So why were they uh, engaging in this kind of philanthropy? Um, the 1881 pogroms were extremely decisive. Uh, it really catapulted uh, thousands of migrants to North America, leading to these agricultural colonies in particular. Um, it was also a product of mass media hysteria in uh, Great Britain, which of course controlled so much of the world. The British press was very important. Uh, they were really motivated by a lot of Russophobia. I can't get into it too much. I can answer questions about it, but they arguably exaggerated some of the pogroms that were uh, perpetrated against the Jews. And uh, that's, it's an important historical fact to reconcile ourselves with. So British Jewry had an important role in uh, this process. Uh, and this is just uh, a list of immigrants and where they were sent, uh, some of the places, including Alliance um, and a map. So New Jersey, as a result, almost became a American Zion, an American um, Israel. You know, it actually looks kind of like Israel when you think about it. Uh, but Jews were very densely consolidated. They were close to big cities like Philadelphia, New York City, which is, of course, important because they were major Jewish centers. It helped to maintain a kind of Jewish consciousness. Um, and there were many ideologues who wanted Jews settled in this fashion, very close together, so that they would operate as a sort of society within a society. Um, but it's important to see this more as a New Jersey thing, because New Jersey had a long history of uh, being a utopian landscape. Uh, Charles Landis is a famous uh, figure in New Jersey history, and uh, he really established Vineland in the 1850s. And he's the one who cleared the land for the Jews, ultimately, to build this agricultural con. And he did so for arguably proto-socialist reasons. Uh, there were also anarchists and Quakers in the area. So Amalam really fits into this picture. Uh, New Jersey really was this laboratory for different utopian experiments. Um, and the Jews were not exceptional in that way. Uh, why they, uh, why this confluence of utopian projects is something I'm researching. Um, I don't have a positive answer yet, <laughs> but it certainly makes sense. Um, and it's juxtaposed really with industrial New York City at the same time, Philadelphia, of course, sort of the dark, gloomy industrial settings compared to these agricultural colonies. Um, and this is how they would recruit people with, uh, you know, the flyers, almost like recruiting someone to the army. 
So we have to ask, uh, were they Jewish Americans? Were they doing this for purely Jewish reasons? Did they become American Jews or just solely Americans? Um, and this is a religious question, of course. There are differences between Reform Judaism, which was more assimilationist and more popular among German Jews, at least at the beginning of this period, versus Orthodoxy, Yiddishkeit, were they speaking Yiddish, were they speaking English? Uh, within most of these colonies, after three generations, Yiddish largely fades out, but that's actually somewhat positive compared to other places where Yiddish phased out almost immediately. Um, outside of the alliance and Brotonville and other colony uh, nexus, most of these colonies collapsed very quickly. Uh, many of these colonies actually in a couple of decades later were established in uh, places like Oregon or Missouri in the interior or the West. And they were passed into other people's hands and Gentiles' hands after almost a generation or two. Uh, and so they weren't Jewish colonies after a very short period. But Alliance, uh, there's even a reboot community today, a, a community trying to make it a Jewish agricultural colony once more. Uh, so there's still this continuing legacy, um, this still this you know consciousness that you don't see really anywhere else. Um, it's also worth noting that many of them immigrated to Israel as soon as the state of Israel was founded and joined the uh, burgeoning Moshavim and uh, Chabutzim, uh, these agricultural movements in Israel. Um, bringing their training from the US to uh, these colonies there. Uh, and so that suggests ideological motivations, even in the 1940s. Uh, were they American at that point if they basically left for Israel? <laughs> um, and this is very significant, especially uh, to me, because, well, first of all, this photo is my great, great, great grandfather, Joseph Greenblatt. <laughs> uh, so I have a tangible connection to this. And many of my Jewish peers do not have this. Most American Jews don't because of the Holocaust. The Holocaust is one of the reasons why it was so uh, terrible and tragic is that it wiped out so much of Jewish history, so many people, so many stories. Um, and so this uh, makes this wave of Jewish uh, migration important on a cultural level for Jews today. Um, Ellis Island might have been where they entered the United States, especially later on, but Alliance, at least in my family's case, is where they became American, where they did something that is seen as something quintessentially American, uh, you know, building a community from the ground like this, farming, having a homestead, right? Um, but at the same time, uh, as the fact that many of these colonies collapsed very quickly would suggest, uh, there's also something uh, tragic from a Jewish perspective about these colonies. Uh, the fact that so many uh, Jews from these colonies ended up losing Yiddish, losing any attachment to traditional Judaism, um, moving to the cities and essentially abandoning their entire lifestyle. Uh, so we might ask if this was uh, purely a humanitarian project, in that respect, was the mission accomplished? Did they save people, give them economic opportunities that they did not have in Poland? Uh, or did it succeed in making these people Americans? Um, these are complex questions about identity that continue to bedevil the Jewish community today. Uh, but New Jersey was uh, the place where many of my forebears, at least, uh, first asked these questions. Uh, so thank you for having me. And uh, I thought that was informative. Wow, that was another um, very um, passionate and community-based presentation. This is one of the things that was really exciting uh, for me with this conference was looking at the potential for how we could, um, on one hand, potentially have a conference about studying systems and the various apparatus or things that people did or structures that they created um, to engage communities in history and civics and things like that versus looking at the history. And it's so fascinating that in um, both of these presentations so far, you know, we get to really like look a little closer at the, the structures as well as kind of the ideology ideologies um, behind them. So thank you very much, Jonah. Okay, uh, now I will take this opportunity to introduce our final panelist, uh, Ms. Hyacinth Miller. Hyacinth Miller is an assistant teaching professor in Rutgers University, Newark School of Arts and Sciences 
in African American and African Studies and Political Science Departments. She has also worked as a lecturer in the Department of Latino and Caribbean Studies, Rutgers University, New Brunswick. Her research focuses on Caribbean immigrants in the diaspora, immigrant women and women of color in elected leadership, immigrant political incorporation and comparative politics. Hyacinth has conducted original research and presented conference papers about West Indians in the US, West Indians in elected office in New Jersey, Haitian Americans in the United States, and on multiple citizenship policies in the Caribbean. Prior to working for Rutgers University, Hyacinth spent more than 10 years working as a government affairs analyst and lobbyist and staffer to elected officials on the city and federal levels. She has also served as a criminal justice program associate and fundraising professional. Thank you, Hyacinth. Uh, today, thank you. Thank you for having me. A special thanks to the New Jersey Historical Commission for putting this very important virtual conference together. And I enjoyed hearing the papers from my co-presenters about Jewish communities. And I'm going to apologize in advance. Apparently there's some construction going on at four o'clock on a Friday. So I apologize if the noise is too much. So for today's presentation, I'm going to actually talk about a new old community, um, the Caribbean community, and my presentation's title is the New Jersey's Caribbean Political Elite. As Lorraine said, I'm a professor of Africana Studies and Political Science, and I come to this research as somewhat of Caribbean background by way of New York, but I'm very much interested in documenting the lives and stories of Caribbean people in the ways that were not um, in the ways that they were not able to be documented, as um, my co-presenter Jonah said. So at the risk of losing the identity and losing the people, uh, my uh, individual purpose is to make sure that these stories are not lost. So for today's presentation, I'll give a little bit of background about the Caribbean community, about the Caribbean. Um, I'll trouble the use of my term Caribbean and West Indian and how I find them both interchangeable and problematic. I'll talk about the elite leadership that's based in New Jersey, also the Caribbean organizations and the Caribbean diaspora from New Jersey that has already been making a significant impact in both the Caribbean and in the communities from where they come, and also ideas for future research projects that I'm thinking of. So this is an ongoing project for me. I began it some time ago when I noticed that when I worked for a Caribbean born elected official that her experiences were somewhat different than those of African Americans and so Caribbean people well. I define Caribbean people as those from this Caribbean region. It has uh, more than 7,000 islands. And for the purposes of this conversation, I will not be discussing those of Latino descent. So I'll be talking about those who are Francophone, Dutch Atlantic, uh, English speaking, as well as French. And then um, I'll try to um, explain how and why those from Panama, possibly Costa Rica, Honduras, Nicaragua, also the South American coast can sometimes be included in this discussion of the Caribbean. So before I launch into a discussion about Caribbean immigrants in Canada and New York City, um, why, why is Caribbean and West Indian sometimes both uh, problematic and sometimes interchangeable. So Caribbean people are from the Caribbean. That's not up for argument. However, those who are called West Indian 
are, are from the non-English speaking Caribbean. So oftentimes when people are doing uh, research on West Indians, they will separate Haiti, Guadeloupe, Martinique. Sometimes they will separate Suriname, which is Dutch speaking and the ABC islands, which are Dutch speaking. So, so there's a lot of political geography and um, matchmaking happening within the Caribbean region. So I try to include um, all the other islands that are not listed. And also when I get to the section where I talk about the actual population, it's very difficult trying to track down this population because they have different names in the census. So originally, um, Anna Zilberstein details a temporary settlement of the Jamaican uh, Maroons in Nova Scotia from 1796 in her book, A Temperate Empire. So there's a Maroon community in Jamaica. They negotiated a treaty with the British Empire so that they would be, in essence, left alone. So when Napoleon was making his trek across the world to um, be the world leader, there were Maroons from Jamaica that were sent to Nova Scotia to protect this area from Napoleonic invasion. So there are traces of Caribbean people, i.e. Jamaicans, in Nova Scotia as early as seven, uh, 1796. Then Irma Watkins, in her book, um, Blood Relations, most recently published, looked at census data between 1900 and 1930 and discovered that there were 40,000 plus immigrants that settled in New York City, usually in Harlem during this early 20th century. Again, the, the reason why Caribbean immigrants tend to be invisible is because they are Black, so they are subsumed under the Black or African-American pan-identity. So it makes it a little bit difficult to, to excavate um, some of their stories. And for um, just edification, there are two very famous uh, Caribbean people from the New York City region, which has also led, from, led me to do this research in New Jersey. The first is Stephanie St. Clair, who was deemed the queen of numbers. She was a gangster, a civil rights advocate, a fashionista, and a businesswoman. I am desperately waiting for this story, for, for her story to come to the big screen. However, she was either from Guadeloupe or Martinique, even though she told people that she was from France. And then another person who was very instrumental in um, shaping African-American history vis-a-vis -vis Harlem was Hubert Harrison, and he was called the Black Socrates. So it's from this tradition that I look toward New Jersey to try and understand what Caribbean people may have been doing in New Jersey as early as maybe the 1800s or 1900s, but I have to start with the information that I, that I can readily find, which deals with the 20th century. So the Caribbean population of New Jersey. Um, so there are about four and a half million Caribbean people in the US and again, Caribbean non-Latino. And um, of that four and a half million, approximately 200,000, give or take, reside in the state of New Jersey, which is, its, which is the equivalent of about 2% of New Jersey's uh, 9 million population. So here's a breakdown that I provide of the types of Caribbean people who live in New Jersey. And based on sheer numbers, we can see that the largest numbers come from Guyana, which is roughly 26,000, Haiti, which is roughly 65, 66,000, and Jamaica, which is roughly 76,000. And so there are two columns that I was able to um, extract from census data. And this information is taken from the ACS 2021. So with the first column, we see those who are identifying of West Indian background, who said that this is their only ancestry. And these are the numbers here in the first column. So we see that according to the census that people are from Bermuda are smaller than people from the Dutch West Indies. Again, the Dutch West Indies could be Aruba, Bonaire, Curacao, Suriname, St. Martin, St. Eustatius. These are notably called the Dutch West Indies or the Dutch Atlantic. 
But the second column, you see that there's multiple ancestries that may include these people from the West Indies. This West Indies other column signals to me that these are people from St. Vincent and the Grenadines, maybe St. Nevis, uh, I'm sorry, St. Kitts Nevis, and some of the smaller islands that whose population don't quite measure up high enough to be considered um, their single category. And in terms of where the West Indian people live, Again, I highlight the five major cities. So these are the top cities where they live. Uh, this is the total population of the town or city. And this is the approximate percentage of West Indians. So they go as high as 19% in Orange, New Jersey, to as low as 2.5% in um, Jersey City. However, the percentage of the population is somewhat misleading because being 9% of 25,000 is certainly a different number than being 9% of 15,000. So here's where I list the numbers. So there's approximately 6,400 in Orange, almost 11,000 in East Orange, I'm sorry, in Irvington, about 9,000 in East Orange, about 9,200 in Newark, and about 7,000 in Jersey City. And these numbers tend to align with where you see the Caribbean political elite emerging or the West Indian political elite emerging. Um, it seems as though they're following the pattern of emerging from places where their numbers are significant. And this would conform to what research shows. So here are some of the... Um, Caribbean elected officials. Let me just see if I can fix this a little bit so I can see it a tad better. Okay, so what I found is that there are four groups that are represented in the research that I've found so far. They are represented from the countries of Haiti, Jamaica, Barbados, and Guyana. Again, that would conform with the numbers that are being presented. And so here we have Charnette Frederick, who's a councilwoman from Irvington Township, Essex County. She is a scientist by training. She's a PhD from um, Seton Hall University. And she has been in and around elective office for about 10 years or so. Uh, she's very intertwined with both the Haitian community and the African-American community. And as a matter of fact, she's actually in charge of, well, she's chairwoman of the organization um, that charts how many Haitian-American elected officials there are in the country. So she's extremely active. And uh, when I approached her about possibly seeking higher office, you know, as a good politician does, she says she'll weigh her options. Um, the next person is Izo Berg. He's a formal council president in Roselle Park Township. Uh, that's in Essex County. He, he is former, so he had been a member of the Roselle community, Roselle Park community, and um, his background is also in science. He was in pharmaceutical sales, and when he got laid off, um, he turned to community engagement, which then led to him being elected. Uh, the next person, oops, sorry, is um, the former mayor of South Tom's River, Joseph Champagne, who's a very successful attorney in private practice. And when I was doing this research, I found it rather odd that there was a Haitian-born American with a not not a thick Haitian accent, but enough of an accent to know that he was not American um, as mayor of South Tons River. And so when I did ask him about this, he said, well, he's one of two Haitian families. So clearly his appeal was not the fact that he was Haitian, but the fact that, you know, he was a fresh face in politics. Another person of Haitian descent is Jerry Balmer. who's a former county freeholder in Hudson County. Um, after leaving office, he has um, or he's the co-owner of a political consulting firm. He has about two decades in uh, New Jersey government, and he's also very much embedded with the Haitian community, trying to do things to both um, 
teach the Haitian community to become more politically engaged and also giving back to Haiti. The final two people who I have found who are part of this, this political, this burgeoning political elite in the state of New Jersey are our most recent associate justice, the first African-American slash Caribbean American woman, Fabiana Pierre-Louis, and also Sybil Elias, who is a judge in the municipal court. The next group that I'll be talking about are um, members of the Jamaican community. There are two women and one man so far. And again, I did not, there's a lot of information to mine, so I did not go as, as far down as the school board, but I'm sure when I get the opportunity to, there are more people who may be considered African-American that actually have their ancestry from somewhere else. So the first person I'll talk about is Carolyn Chang. She's a former mayor of West, Amst of West Hampton Township in Burlington County. She's also uh, in the administrative uh, in an in an administrative position with the um, Black Women's Lawyers Association of New Jersey. She also has a very successful practice focused on family law, and she is very much embedded in the community. Um, she argues that there are not a lot of West Indians or not a lot of Jamaicans in West Hampton, so she has sought to connect to Caribbean communities throughout the state. Next, we have Elsie Foster, who's a former council president and acting mayor in the borough of Highland Park, which is in Middlesex County. Elsie Foster has been a part of electoral politics in Highland Park for almost two decades. Um, she is currently serving in an administrative capacity as well in Middlesex County. She is an entrepreneur. Um, so in looking at the people who have risen to the ranks of um, this this level of political engagement, I start to see particular patterns emerging about their demography, um, how much education they have, where they might have gone to school, uh, the types of things that they do prior to and while they are elected officials. And formal, there's William McCoy from the city of Patterson in Passaic County. He's a former councilman and he served, I want to say, about four terms. And he was he's very instrumental in platforming the Jamaican community in Patterson. And I'll talk about one of the ways he was successfully a part of doing that in a few more slides. So the last presentation of the elected officials that I was able to locate are um, three, two from Barbados, one from Guyana. So we have Adrian Mapp, who is, sorry, not the former mayor, but actually the current mayor of the city of Plainfield. He was elected in 2021 to a historic third term. No one has done that before him. There is a significant, well, relatively significant population of um, Bayesian people in Barbados from whom he gets um, his support, but he argues that he is um, as successful as an elected leader, not only because of his ties to the Caribbean community or the Bayesian community, but because the people see him as someone who gets the job done. Next, we have Vera Greaves, who only served one term as a city councilwoman in Plainfield. She argued that, you know, politics was just not her thing. She was excited about it, but then realized that she's best serving, she's best serving the community through her real estate practice. And last but not least, we have Chico Ramchal, who's a former councilman of Jersey City, Hudson County and he hails from Guyana. His term was short-lived. However, he's very much engaged in the Guyanese goings-on in the state of New Jersey. Oops, sorry about that. Back to presentation. Thank you so much, Hyacinth. Um, I am, at this time, I would love to invite all of the panelists to turn their cameras and microphones on for Q&A. Hi,
Wow. So first I'd like to say thank you to all of the presenters. Um, I am um, listening to the presentations. I was making um, just different connections um, between um, the stories and just listening to the different um, ways of um, organizing, but then also just kind of like relating it to other kind of um, what we call larger narratives and seeing how there are these opportunities for us to really like explode kind of these larger narratives where these communities have been left out of those dialogues um, and ensuring that they're a part of um, the larger stories. I think someone said that in the last, during the Teaching Asian Studies um, panel. Um, so I guess we will kick off this question and answer session. We'll start with the question in the Q&A, and then I guess we can just proceed to have a conversation um, about a couple of things. So um, I would like to encourage any folks who are currently uh, watching to please share any questions you have in the Q&A and we will tend to them. So I see here it says, thank you, Mr. Free for a great presentation. Can you expand a bit more on why New Jersey became the location for these utopian communities? What kind of Jewish community here before the 19th century ones you described? Sure. <laughs> Uh, well, there weren't that many Jews in New Jersey before the 1850s. Uh, there were a couple of largely Sephardic Jews. Uh, New Jersey was unique in that it was one of the first states, I believe 1844, to grant um, the franchise to Jews. Uh, contrary to popular belief, the revolution did not automatically mean people like Jews could vote. Uh, it really meant Anglo-Saxon Protestant people could vote, <laughs> unless you're in Maryland where you had to be uh, Catholic. Uh, well, it didn't have to be Catholic, but it was a Catholic majority state. Um, so uh, there were Jews, but there were very few. I believe there was one important uh, mayor or maybe it was a tax collector in Piscataway. Um, but it's really like individuals like that that you uh, think about. 1850s, you start to see German Jews, uh, many of them settling in Trenton and other places. Uh, but again, it's not the collective... Um, sort of intentional settlement that the Jewish agricultural colonies that I presented about represented. That was a planned migration. It was a community. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a community in Ukraine deciding, okay, all of us, let's go settle in New Jersey. You know, someone kind of planned it. It wasn't a group of people from there deciding to go to New Jersey. But the idea that it should be a community distinctly Jewish in New Jersey, that was what separated it from a previous Jewish settlement in the state. As to why New Jersey, uh, it's somewhat of a negative answer <laughs> in that uh, elite German Jews in New York City were concerned that Jews um, coming into the city were a threat, uh, not to them necessarily, but to the Jewish community as a whole, because they were different. They were Orthodox. They were flum, as we say in Yiddish. They uh, observed uh, Shabbat. They uh, didn't work on Sabbath. They kept kosher. Uh, they dressed like Hasidim with, uh, you know, black hats and everything, right? The assimilated German Jews uh, were largely reform, as I said, especially some of the uh, major figures in the aid organizations like the uh, HEAS, uh, Moritz Ellinger, one of its, uh, I believe it's uh, chief foreign officer at one point. He was a leader in the reform Jewish movement. So there's that difference. Um, Jewish emigrants, especially Orthodox, uh, Hasidic even, um, Jewish emigrants from Poland were a hot potato in this period. Different Jewish communities across Europe and then ultimately North America were passing them uh, between each other because they didn't want to be stuck with them. In mm -hmm. Europe, uh, especially London, there was concern about mass Jewish settlement leading to riots, leading to you know the entire Jewish community getting expelled. Uh, People, uh, especially the you know working class, uh, especially Irish people, actually in the UK, were concerned about uh, cheap Jewish labor undercutting their their wages. Right? It was also about union politics, um, and so uh, the people who uh, envisioned uh, this you know Jewish agricultural settlement project were motivated by uh, this fear of anti-Semitism, uh, especially 
that which would erupt from consolidating Jews in the city as they were, um, and it was leading to class tensions, racial tensions, um, but it was ideological. It was also this uh, belief, sincerely, that uh, return to the land meant that uh, Jewish redemption would come about. Uh, that Jews wouldn't know, wouldn't have a place among nations unless they could return to the to the pasture the way that their forefathers had. Um, so it's a mix of reasons. Um, but why New Jersey in particular? It's the proximity to New York City. Um, any question, or rather, any answer in uh, Jewish historiography should start with where was there a Jewish cemetery? Because that's what Jews care more about than anything else, <laughs> at least historically. It's really about where they die and where they're buried. Um, and the proximity to important Jewish centers meant that there were cemeteries, meant that uh, there were, you know, there was easy access to important Jewish uh, items like etrogim, um, which is an important uh, fruit for uh, sukkahs. Uh, it's an important Jewish holiday. Uh, so it's things like that. Um, it's also, of course, cheap land uh, close to New York City. I mean, uh, I could get into how Charles Landis and some of his policies, uh, policies sorry, meant that the land was comparatively cheap in Vineland compared to other places, but uh, suffice to say that there was a, a multiplicity of reasons. So um, that was interesting, your last note of that they were still in proximity to um, New York City. Um, you know, as we are all traditionally thinking of uh, Jewish communities in urban areas like Newark or, or Manhattan. Um, you also made me think a little bit about the, there was an article I read um, a couple of years ago about Irish, the resettlement of Irish in Boston um, back to Ireland. Um, I think that was like between 1840 and the 1870s. Um, one of the questions I had for um, Professor Strum was, in what ways did you feel, like, did you feel that the women that were organizing to help these communities um, were doing that as a part of their general social justice work? Or um, and did you feel that there was anything different about their organizing? Um, that was outside of the traditional um, women's um, community work, helping the poor um, and other, you know, subjugated groups within their own peer group? Well, you have to split it into two. Mm -hmm. First are the non-Irish women, and their primary mo motivation was public charity. Mm -hmm. And this was true of, for example, there were Irish relief committees uh, headed by women in Brooklyn. Uh, there was Irish relief committees involving women in Binghamton, New York, uh, Galena, Illinois. And so women were actively involved in Irish relief in 1847 and in 1880. Um, and so when mentioned, I mentioned it in you know, places like Jersey City, it is again that women essentially felt it was part of also their responsibility as uh, citizens uh, who felt that there was a common bond with the Irish people and the Irish were in a predicament and again, Christian charity required assistance, regardless of whether they were Protestant or Catholics, that was indifferent for this issue. Separately are the Irish women, uh, like the members essentially of Parnell's family, they're motivated by Irish nationalism and support for the Irish national cause, get the Brits out of Ireland. And if you can't get the Brits out of Ireland, make land reform, because the problem was that most of the land in Ireland was not controlled by the Irish, it was controlled by an Anglo-Irish elite, uh, essentially an old aristocracy, which had been imposed on Ireland as a result of the British conquest of Ireland back in the, you know, the 16th century. And so their motivation is nationalism. But in, in within that, in the formation of the Irish Land League chapters, there's an element of feminism that essentially women saw this as an opportunity to do things independently of men, independently of the social restrictions imposed by the church, by the family, by society on them. 
by getting involved in the Irish, the female, I mean, as the ladies Irish Land League chapters. And they were formed all across the United States. Um, well, actually all over, let's say not all over the United States, all over the Northeastern and Midwestern part of the United States. You know, like Boston was a real hotbed for Irish Land League, for female Irish Land League chapters. And, uh, you know, it spread all over New England, parts of New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and also into Canada as well. Mm -hmm. And that was the legacy of the Parnell sisters. Again, this was women led, and there were also, by the way, in Ireland, female Irish Land League chapters, because uh, that's what Anna Parnell did. She went back to Ireland and she started organizing, uh, again, Irish Land League chapters, but again, women's Land League chapters, ladies' land chapters, mm -hmm. it was called officially. And so, again, you have to draw a distinction between the non Irish and the Irish, and then also draw a distinction in the mixed motivations. Because again, the Land League chapters of Irish women appeal to a lot of working class women. Mm -hmm. that this was a sense of independence, a sense of autonomy as being a member of the ladies Irish Land League chapters. So I guess, I mean, that leads me to another question. I guess I'll ask all of you starting off with um, Professor Miller is just, um, I think often when we think of immigrant immigrant and migrant communities, we always think of uh, direct service um, donations to homeland um, and other like sites. Um, one of the questions I just had um, that kind of piggybacks off of Professor Strums for a doctor, for a Professor Miller and for um, Mr. Freed is in what ways do West Indian communities um, advocate, or how are they able to advocate politically um, in their homeland, islands, territories, um, countries, um, from here, from Plainfield, Newark? Um, is there really that opportunity or is it mainly um, direct service? So with the Caribbean community in the diaspora period, and particularly stateside, they are able to interact with the political folks at home. And in many cases, they fundraise for their political candidate in their um, sending country or mm -hmm. home country. And the other thing that... Um, gets a little bit more complicated is for those people with more than one Caribbean ancestry, they're mm -hmm. advocating for more than one thing. So they do that politically through um, direct support of candidates. They do that mm -hmm. through remittances. They send home money to do any number of things, including to uplift the communities from whence they came. And they also do uh, direct services like medical care, um, uh, disaster relief, the uh, volcano that recently erupted in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, they mobilized very quickly in New Jersey. There's an organization, New Jersey for Haiti, that does a lot of organ organizing around disaster relief for any number of issues that affect. So yeah, they're, 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 they're um, super sensitive and hyper vigilant about helping uh, the home sending country. Mm. So uh, Jonah, you might've touched on this in your presentation and pardon me if I overlooked it, but what were the ways that um, folks here or that, that you may know of um, that were a part of the alliance, like the more formal ways that they advocated for political change potentially in, in their um, home spaces or sites of? Well, in the 1880s, uh many of these immigrants were very uh, uneducated for the most part, except for a couple of uh, important intellectuals, such as a famous figure named um, Moses Klein. He wrote a book called uh, Migdal Zofim, which means uh, the watchtower. Uh, mm -hmm. He argues that uh, agriculturalism, <laughs> like what was going on in uh, New Jersey, uh, he was in the Alliance colony, should be a model for uh, the Jewish uh, revival in uh, Palestine. Um, mm. In fact, he argues that uh, the Jewish agricultural project in New Jersey was the same movement as the kibbutzim at that point in uh, mm. 
Uh, he wrote this in 1889. So yeah, Kibbutzim, uh, the first Kibbutzim really <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, in uh, Israel. And uh, of course, there is no home country, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. I mean, well, we're, well, Israel, but uh, you know, spiritually, whatever. But yeah, uh, that's I, a, but yeah, yeah I, I know that. I mean, that that's a that's a we're getting into like you know political stuff, <laughs> but <laughs> um, in 1880, uh, Jews saw themselves as an exile. Um, and to, I mean, there are still communities who see themselves that way, but that's also political. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, at this point, Jews, the, the, uh, my, the professor who advises me, Professor Gershon Hunder, uh, he has a term that I like called exilic consciousness. Uh, Jews were always in exile, especially, you know, from a religious perspective. Um, and so, uh, ex yes, there was a sense of need to help other Jews in, uh, say, uh, Poland at this point escape the hardship that they were facing. Um, but in terms of political organizing, um, it was really uh, engaging themselves in American politics, really um, uh, d eventually donating and taking part in some of these, uh, you know, uh, more German Jewish uh, aid groups, such as the HEAS, uh, Alliances or Lead to the Versailles, et cetera. Um, but later on uh, in the 1890s, 1880s and such, you do see uh, some of the first Zionist organizations in New Jersey and also in North America, starting in um, Alliance, for example. Agadolf Zion, I believe, was the first one. Um, in fact, I'm pretty sure Moses Klein was its uh, first uh, leader. <laughs> also in 1889 or something like that. Um, so yeah, that goes to show you that there is a certain, uh, you know, political um, solution there. I mean, the Amalam movement was a political uh, question, right? It was a answer to uh, political anti-Semitism. Um, and the reason why they settled in New Jersey, at least I would argue, um, and as some historians have argued, uh, as opposed to New York City and other places, was also political. It wasn't just, you know, New Jersey's nice. <laughs> in fact, the soil was terrible. It was awful. Many, uh, it's actually a huge surprise that the colonies didn't collapse because the soil was just terrible. Uh, they were settled there because the people who were paying for it didn't want them to settle in New York City because that would be politically inexpedient. Mm. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's difficult to avoid uh, reducing the settlers in these colonies. Um, we shouldn't deny them their agency. Um, they were absolutely political beings. Uh, I wouldn't say that they weren't, but in terms of uh, I mean, nothing like, you know, organizing for political candidates back home. I mean, they didn't have that uh, political liberty, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess one of the questions um, so were at that time to close is I wanted to find out if you all had any final comments, but more, more so, I think you both, you all have expressed various interventions that you think are necessary um, in the work um, that we explored briefly during this great panel. But um, I, I would be curious um, just to maybe hear just some um, responses to what do you feel are the most kind of overlooked aspects of what you've presented that uh, should urgently be a part of our public education system, our public discourse about the communities that you've discussed? Well, I would argue that one of the aspects of the Irish American experience and also um, of the American experience was that the United States in the 19th century was the leading country for international philanthropy. That mm -hmm. in the 19th century, Congress um, and presidents, whether they were Democratic or Republican, generally opposed any kind of public aid. No public appropriations, with one or two exceptions, were ever appropriated by Congress. This all depended on voluntary aid. Either part of it were remittances that Professor Miller just mentioned, coming from the Irish community during the Great Hunger of 1847 or the Little Famine of 1880 or the food shortages of the 1860s. And then I didn't mention this, but there's a fourth round of a starvation in Ireland, 1890-91. And there's another round of Americans in New Jersey and New York elsewhere raising money for Ireland. 
this mm. became, again, it's the role of Americans in international philanthropy, but it is a people to people movement, not a government to government movement, unlike since World War II, when it's been government aid primarily uh, as part of American foreign policy. But this was not the case in the 19th century into the early 20th. And let me piggyback quickly on uh, something uh, that Jonah dealt with. Um, in looking at how Jews responded, because I just wrote an article, actually I didn't just write it, I wrote two years ago, I'm trying to get it published. Um, it's on the solidarity of all Israel in, a, in the context of Albany, New York. From 1853 to 2011, Albany Jews, whenever there was a crisis of Jews abroad, they organized. They held public meetings denouncing the governments that were persecuting Jews. Where there were circumstances, they would raise money. Uh, they would involve non-Jews uh, from 1853 when it involved Austria to the 1903 to 1905 during the pogroms in Russia. Uh, they were, there were involvements of, you know, of uh, getting involved with fundraising and during World War I, uh, essentially doing the same thing because of the situation of Jews being pushed out. 600,000 Jews got pushed out of their communities in Russia by the Tsarist government. And uh, literally um, in the wake of World War I, um, there were mass killings of Jews in Poland, 40,000 Jews were murdered. Uh, in Russia, uh, 100,000 Jews were murdered. Another 150,000 died of starvation, disease, et cetera. And again, Jewish communities in Albany and elsewhere in the United States were essentially raising money, raising awareness. And sometimes they had support of various uh, non-Jewish political leaders. For example, in New York, uh, the First Irish Catholic governor of New York, Martin Glynn, uh, wrote an article in 1919, used first time used the word Holocaust, referring to the killings of Jews in Eastern Europe. Mm. So again, this is something that you know the Irish did, something Jews did, as far as reacting to what's happening in case of Ireland, specific old country. In the case of Jews, it was wherever Jews were that were in trouble. Mm. If I could respond quickly to something uh, mm -hmm. Professor Strub said, um, I'd also note that Parnell was an early exponent of Zionism. <laughs> he visited uh, parts of uh, southern, uh, well, southeastern Europe, uh, Bessarabia, and uh, argued that Zionism was the only solution to uh, the Jewish question. Um, so that's also an interesting uh, relationship between the Irish uh, cause and the Jewish question, the Jewish cause um, during that time period. Um, Albany is also an interesting point. Um, I will say that uh, Jewish philanthropy is a broad historiographical question. Um, I even have a book here about uh, <laughs> about Jewish philanthropy and Jewish, oh, it's blurry, but it's called uh, Rescue the Surviving Souls. It's about uh, how Jewish communities across the world really responded to the first major Jewish, uh, well, first major uh, early modern <laughs> Jewish refugee crisis after the Kamielski uprising in Poland in uh, 18, oh, sorry, 1648, um, when uh, also thousands of Jews were massacred. Um, so uh, it's worth asking if it's a American thing or if it's a Jewish thing um, in the, or both within the Jewish context specifically. Um, certainly when we're talking about other diasporas like Ireland, of course, um, it becomes more complicated, um, but uh, I would also point out that um, the Purim Association, which was a major uh, conference of Jewish donors, uh, well, not just Jewish donors, um, in the uh, 1880s, although it actually started uh, decades earlier, um, they, uh, first of all, had not Jews, as I mentioned, but elevated the Jews' status, as they put it, in uh, American society. Um, so yeah, it's a very fascinating uh, period. There was a, there's a recent book out about uh, the Gilded Age in Jewish history, um, Gilded Age in American Jewish history, sorry. <laughs> and I look forward to reading that. Um, but uh, just to answer your question briefly, if I have time, uh, Professor uh, Williams. 
Um, well, no? okay, Ms. we're good. Miss Williams, but um, <laughs> we're you, good. We're good. You you have you you can you can make a a a, a, a succinct comment, and then um, <laughs> I, and then I guess Professor Miller will close out. Sorry, Professor Miller. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, well, yeah, no, just the quick thing is, I mean, obviously, uh, I think yesterday the FBI warned about uh, threats to synagogues in New Jersey. Um, so I would, uh, I think that in terms of, uh, you know, how we could change the way this kind of history has changed, um, I think it's important to emphasize just how uh, complex anti-Semitism is and uh, how uh, anti-Semitism manifested in the 1880s as well. Um, to, I, would, I would just say that, uh, when we talk about anti-Semitism in this country, it's often just the Holocaust that people learn about. They don't learn about anything else. Yeah, that's true. Um, you asked a very interesting question, and I want to highlight the fact that in Jonah's presentation, he said that these groups, all of these groups, have had to navigate complex identities. So in listening to both mm -hmm. you and Dr. Strum speak, you know, I can't speak that way about the Caribbean because it, they were colonized and they were enslaved. Mm -hmm. So anything prior to that, they are very small pockets of people who experienced the freedoms, you know, the freedom to get up and go somewhere else to seek this sort of relief that both of you talked about. Um, but just in terms of Black people, the Black diaspora, I think what's important in the work that I'm doing is I am hypervigilant that people need to be disaggregated like you know not all black people are from the U.S. not all Caribbean people are from the Caribbean and so I think it's important to give people their individual identity while also placing them within this political uh I guess pan-ethnic title of being part of a particular community um a future research project you know if anyone wants to give me money to look this up <laughs> Um, I'm look. I'm looking at blacks from Europe because there are a contingent of blacks in Europe whose identity is erased once they come to the U.S. because of the, you know, the strict um, binary of being black or white and and not not appreciating the nuances and complexities of being, you know, a black other. And this is in no way um, trying to dilute the political integrity of being part of this pan-ethnic group, but, you know, people like their differences or like their own cultures to be platform and centered and researched and documented for posterity's sake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, just in closing, you know, definitely one of the things I, I thought about in just the closing comments and just piggybacking off of Professor Miller is that a lot of people just do not understand the ongoing conversations within groups and between groups about nationality, <laughs> about identity, about solutions to oppression. Um, I, I, I wish I had a penny for any time anyone's discussed the word African American or Black or et cetera, and how folks just don't know that they're forums. I mean, in the 1800s, there were forums about discussions about titles, what solutions. People have been discussing solutions, let's just say, uh, for a very, very long time. And I, um, I, I thought of that when um, uh, Jonah was speaking, you know, just how folks don't understand in one group, you can have these multiple perspectives, multiple solutions. I know it was such a big thing to me in high school when I learned even about the development of Zionism and how people were proposing different homelands. And I was 17 and I was like, oh, you, there, there were different <laughs> potential homelands and other safety space. Like I was, I was just like boggled by that idea. Um, and so, um, in closing, I would just like to say thank you all. Uh, I like I would like to echo the executive director of the New Jersey Historical Commission. I'll just read her words, and I would like to say thank you all for just this great presentation. Um, there's are just so many fascinating and impactful narratives that you all have shared, um, and I really look forward to um, getting the feedback. 
on the conference in the next two weeks, we'll be sending surveys um, and we'll also be sending the recordings to all of you um, to view. And then uh, as I expressed earlier, they will be all shared on YouTube in March and then we'll continue to promote um, the videos there, which I have to say has been the one good thing that has come out of um, this um, COVID quarantine is this um, opportunity for people to have a deeper engagement in these um, public humanities and public history issues. Um, and for these um, free sites like YouTube and things like that, for folks to have opportunities to see a program like this, you know. Um, so, and on that note, um, and then I'll just close, Twyla uh, indicated absolutely more educated education is needed to end heat and understand the complexity dealing with our American heritage and history. Thank you for the contributions of, of the at the conference. And with that, I will say good night and, and please look forward to our emails in the next couple of weeks. And um, thank you all and have a good day.